prophet Daniel, the tenth chapter. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <coughs> he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. The epistle reading is from the Revelation of St. John, the 12th chapter. Now, war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Cut it off and throw it away. 
It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man came to save the lost. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So who are they, these angels? 
angels that Jesus sends to do his bidding. Just what kind of beings are they? What do we know about them? According to the Holy Scriptures, the angels are created beings. Sometime during the six days of creation, the Lord God spoke them into existence, just as he created all things through the power of his word. And he called them his angels, his messengers. To our eyes, these unseen spirits, or I should say, while our eyes can't see these unseen spirits, they are around us, doing the will of God. And they're often referred to as ministering spirits because they are active in this world, doing our Lord's bidding. And remember this as well. There are both good and evil angels. There are good angels who serve the Lord and wicked, fallen angels who serve the devil. They're called demons. And don't be fooled. They are active around us as well. But thanks be to God. Two-thirds of the angels remain faithful to the Lord, and they watch over and protect us. You know, we have perhaps even encountered angels without knowing it, because we humans have rarely ever been allowed to see the angels. The scriptures tell us we have entertained angels unawares, as they can take on human form. And perhaps we've even benefited from their protection without knowing it. Because the angels do act in God's direction and by his authority, ultimately for our sakes, according to his will. The Bible is clear. There's an unseen, supernatural world around us with lots going on that we're not privy to. We may see the results of this unseen spiritual activity in our world as human history sees the rise and fall of nations. We see the protection of the angels, perhaps, in our daily lives as we avoid danger and even death. The angels have even been sent to protect the church, and even we as individual believers. So we may see the results, but we don't see the angels themselves. Sometimes at key moments in salvation history, God has let us catch glimpses of the angels as they appear to bring their messages of salvation to this world. And these things have been recorded for us in the scriptures. And that, of course, is the only really reliable source of information we have about angels. Of course, curiosity and the imagination likes to make up all kinds of things about angels. Most of it false and misleading. Things from the imagination rather than from the rock-solid truth of God's word. So don't base what you know about angels on anything that you've seen on TV shows or in movies, or even what some person claims to have received as a direct revelation from an angel. Because remember, any angel who speaks apart from God's word is not one of God's ministering <laughs> angels, but an agent of the foe, the devil. Remember what Paul said, if even an angel comes and speaks to you a different gospel, let him be accursed. And so we always go back to God's word. That's where we learn about everything we need to know for this life and for our salvation, including the angels and their activities. And so the truth about angels is this. They are first and foremost messengers of God. Albeit incredibly powerful, often warlike messengers of God. Remember it was an angel that stood at the gateway of the Garden of Eden with a flaming sword to protect Adam and Eve from trying to come back in and live an eternal life in sin. But the word angel does mean messenger. It comes from the Greek word angelos and can be translated as exactly that, the messenger. That's the word that the Bible uses to identify these unseen spirits because we often encounter them. That's what they're doing, delivering a message. God sent his angels to deliver messages to man, particularly at critical moments in God's dealing with humankind. That's when they make their appearances. For example, the angel Gabriel was sent first to Zechariah to announce the coming birth of John, the forerunner, forerunner of the Lord. And then the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary to announce that she was to give birth to the Christ child himself. And when she did, on that Christmas, 
Christmas night, an angel appeared to some shepherds out in a field to let them know that the Savior had been born, which is Christ the Lord. And then later, the Lord sent his messenger and angels to announce the resurrection to Mary and the other women who had gathered at the empty tomb. Two young men, angels, and appearing to the ladies, proclaimed the glorious message of the Lord's victory over death when they were the first to announce that he's not here. He's risen from the dead. Of course, there are angels of the ascension as well. Again, angels were sent to deliver the message after 40 days after the Lord's resurrection, telling the disciples, why do you stare looking up into the heavens? Because Jesus will come again in the same way you saw him go into the heavens. And even John, as he saw the revelation and things that would happen as we went or we came nearer to the end, the angels revealed what is going on in heaven even now, worshiping the Lord as we await that last and glorious day. So key moments in the life and work of our Savior Christ are depicted by his angels who come delivering a message to people who would otherwise be bewildered and unable to understand what was happening. And so again, angels are primarily the Lord's messengers. But something else we need to know about angels. They're heavenly worshipers as well. Worshippers of the only true God. You see, angels don't want you to worship them or pray to them. Angels want you to keep your focus where it should be, on your Savior Christ. Again, go back to Christmas night. After the one angel delivers the message to the shepherds, then a whole host of angels light up the sky and send praises to God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. With those words, they joyfully proclaim the wonders that the Lord has done. And their message in itself is an act of worship. Just as we sing to the Lord in our hymns and the canticles of the liturgy, which echo the message that the angels first shared with us. And we get to join in singing with them back to the Lord on this Lord's day. Remember also the throne room scenes in Revelation and also Isaiah where the angels were singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Again, it's a wonderful thing to ponder how the angels in their worship of God set the pattern for our worship in the church. In the historic church liturgy, the main canticle in each half of the divine service is based on these songs. The glory in Excelsis and the... Sanctus in Holy Communion. Again, isn't it something to ponder that the angels set the worship of the church and we follow it? So finally, we must remember that the angels, in addition to being messengers and worshipers of God, are also warriors. And that might disturb our image that we have of angels, since in art and movies they're often depicted as soft, even effeminate creatures. Sometimes they're depicted as cute little cherubs with rosy cheeks and bare bottoms, more baby than warrior. But remember, those images are Hollywood, not biblical. In the Bible, when angels are described, they can be fiery and even frightening. The seraphim, that's what it means, the flaming ones. When angels appear to human beings, they often startle and scare people. So that the first words out of the angels' mouths are often, don't be afraid, fear not. Again, this shouldn't scare us because the Word of God reveals to those who read and mark His Word that angels are fearsome warriors. They do battle for God. We heard it in the readings this morning. They're His troops that are sent out to do battle for us on our behalf against any evil forces that would harm us, whether seen or unseen. God's angels are our guardians and protectors. Guarding the church as a whole and particular churches in various places and times in particular. We hear from the book of Revelation how churches had their angels assigned to them. Now we've talked about the supernatural angels. Let's not forget about the flesh and blood messengers that are also sent to the churches. The pastors who proclaim a message of forgiveness and salvation of God's people as well. Just like the angels, the pastors don't speak on their own. They speak the word of God to you. 
And that's how we're to judge pastors as well. Is it the word of God or some other word that's being proclaimed? And so we remember these angels are messengers from the Lord, powerful warriors. Remember that the angels are to praise the Lord for the good that he has done for humanity, for you and for me. And the angels remember as well that they've been sent to guard and protect us from all harm, physical and spiritual. Remember what St. Matthew wrote, God's little ones have angels who stand in his presence. And so we can say with great confidence and thanksgiving that God does send his angels to watch over us from day to day. We even pray this way in our daily prayers from the Catechism. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. And so we remember the special focus of this day, how God guards and protects us with his angels, particularly St. Michael, the archangel, and how he did battle for us against that old evil foe, the devil, that he might not have power over us. St. Michael's only mentioned a few times but we know that his name means this, who's like God? And of course, we, be, we know the answer is no one. No angel, nothing created can match God's power. But as the angels are sent by God, doing his bidding, acting with his authority, while they may not be as powerful as God, God gives them authority to beat down the devil. God gives them the authority to win the victory because he's already won the victory. You see, no angel has any power in and of himself, just as no Christian has any power in and of themselves, except that which <coughs> God gives. You see, the reason Michael can defeat the devil in battle is because Christ has already defeated him on the cross. How is it that you have victory over the devil? Because of Christ's victory for you. You see, that's why this is considered a festival of Christ this day. We're not praying to the angels or praising them as much as we are thanking the Lord for his sending them and what he has done for us. Because again, it's always Christ and his cross that is given to us for our salvation. His victory over death is what the angels proclaim and what we rejoice in. You see, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, is the one who has ultimately defeated the death, or defeated death and the devil for your sakes and ours, or mine. And so the message of the angels is ultimately this. We Christians win the final victory because Jesus has redeemed us from all sin, from death, and from the power of the devil. You little ones will never be led astray by him or his word, or by any angel that you no, is proclaiming that word to you. Remember, this was promised right from the beginning when God cursed the servant and told the woman, told him that the woman's seed would strike him dead, healing him with fatal love. And of course, Christ did that upon the cross when he was nailed there to suffer for the sins of the world. And doing that, your Lord has taken away the devil's power over you. Your champion, Jesus, took your sins and carried them to the cross and suffered there for your sakes. And in doing that, no angel can accuse you. The devil has no power over you. The devil has nothing left to charge you with before God because everything has been paid in full for your sakes. And so Jesus goes and declares his victory over hell itself. No angel descended into hell to do that. And your Lord has risen from the dead. No angel has done that for you either. Only Christ, through his power, glory, and might. And he's done that for your sakes. And because of that, having faith in him and all that he has done, you will share an eternal life with him, and one day find yourselves in heaven with the angels, praising and glorifying the Lord for his victory that has been given to you. Because just as the angels continue to proclaim, we have conquered through the blood of the Lamb. And God will send his angels to see that you get there as well. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. That's what the psalmist says. And no evil shall prevail against you. So today on this feast of St. Michael and all angels, we remember those ministering spirits sent to serve the Lord and do his will. We also remember the power that they have to throw down Satan and guard the church. And that power comes from Christ's victory. 
just as your victory is in him as well. For Christ has won the victory for you through his death and resurrection. And so this is something for which all of creation praises and worships God. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ.